everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'll just let a few more people come in. Um, my name is Hannah and I'm the UK casting specialist at Backstage. Uh, this is part of our digital slate of content that we've been putting out since March, which is all aimed around helping you guys stay connected to the industry alongside all of our written editorial work. And it's been going down an absolute storm. So um, I'm really excited today because I'm speaking with Susan Wacoma, who I'm such a massive fan of anyway. Um, she has been in amazing TV shows, Chewing Gum, Crazy Head, Year of the Rabbit, Crashing, Dark Money, and it was great because I've seen them all anyway. So um, it, it, was, it was fantastic to be offered Susan McComber to have a chat with today. So hi, Susan, thanks for joining us. Hi, Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. I was just, just saying earlier, I'm in, this is, it's not glam, is it? I'm in my bathroom because it's where there's least noise. So hi guys, hear my reverb, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you, um, well, we've broached the topic now anyway. So if there's like a little bit of um, echo, that's what it is. Let's not that's what it is. about it. I think yeah, if you're secretive about the fact you're in a bathroom and somebody else guesses that you're in a bathroom, that might be yeah. weird. It's weird. So like, if I get really sweaty because it's a hot day and I hop into the shower, which is just here, <laughs> then we all just go, ah, okay, we know, she told us. So. That's fine. We'll just turn the video off and then it'll just become Let's do fun. that. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, so um, as, I, as I was just having a chat with Susan before we started, Backstage is a massive community of actors and filmmakers um, and theatre makers, uh, content creators. Um, so we're going to be speaking to Susan about um, her amazing career up to this point and her experiences so far. So I just, I normally start just asking you, asking people, I should say actors, yeah. Was there like a point for you where you knew that you wanted to act when you were younger? Oh, um, it was a slow progression. So uh, my older sister is called Emmy, Emmy Wakoma, and she always sang in the house. And then um, that sort of went from like wanting to be a recording artist to musical theatre. So musical theatre was kind of like the first thing in our house. And, um, and that didn't appeal to me. I just can't stand singing. I, you know, she's great at it, but that's her thing. Um, but that was kind of when theatre sort of came into our house. And so it didn't, you know, didn't really come from her, even though that was there for free. But it was just my English teacher at a drama, um, secondary school said, oh, I think that you should apply for this thing. And it was National Youth Theatre. And in those days, in those days, um, you, you literally like paid 10 quid. So I saved up my, my lunch money and you go and audition. And then I got in, I was 13 at the time. And then I had to do this course that I had to pay for. I didn't know that I had to pay for the course. So I just asked my teacher because it was her fault. And then they put me in touch with the trust. They paid off this thing. I did a two week course. I, and at that point, I didn't know about acting. I didn't. To be honest, the main thing was I didn't think I could because I didn't see anyone like me. I loved watching comedy particularly, but I didn't, it wasn't an ambition. So National Youth Theatre from the age of 13 to 19 was just like summer camp for me. We did plays, uh, us love boys, um, <laughs> we parties. Uh, it was just the most amazing thing. And actually I think that it was really helpful that it wasn't like an industry thing, like do it, get an agent. There was no worry about it. It just was fun because I associate performing with fun. If I'm not enjoying it, I've, I mean, you'll be hard pushed after my agent. I'm like, is that, does that just look fun? That's for the people that don't look like that. Look at her face, she doesn't look like she's gonna have fun. They do this like, wow, that is a weird parameter to choose work. but. I really associate performing with fun. So yeah. that was the thing that that instilled in me. It wasn't until, you know, sort of picking GCSEs and things like that. So 15, 16, that's when I thought people keep telling me that I'm good at this. So maybe I should explore it. So it was about that time when I started thinking about my future that I was like actor that, so about 15, 16. And then, um, yeah, and then I started being, you know, the great thing about National Youth Theatre, and I went to this Saturday drama group. I was definitely testing the water to see whether I was any good. Yeah. Um, and I had so many mentors and help and advice. That's why I do things like this, because I wouldn't be an actor 
without people going, oh, this is what drama school is, this is what RADA is, oh, you don't have a computer at home, you can stay at school a little bit later and use this laptop and everything like that. So I, yeah, it was around that time and that's when, you know, mentors, about 15, 16 is when I went, okay, I want to do this. That's amazing that, I mean, National Youth Theatre, we've, we've spoken to them a couple of times for backstage and they, yeah. and I've worked with them a couple of times before I worked with backstage as well. And the fact that you could still see it as such fun when it's a real institution, like the people that have come out of NYT is insane. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I did sort of see the list and I was like, oh yeah, that's Helen Mirren. She was in Prime Suspect and yeah, there's that guy. And then slowly I was like, oh, it's quite a lot of stuff. But a lot of people come out of it. But it really did. I mean, I mean, I know that there's been quite a lot of changes with National Youth Theatre, but definitely then it was, you know, it, it, you know, my closest, dearest friends are from National Youth Theatre. My mate Zach, he's a solicitor now. My friend Athena, she works in production. Like we all started off acting, but that's not what we went and go went on to do. All of us, but it's definitely aided our lives. And I love that it started that way. And then I learned about agents and casting directors, and I got my first agent and started working. And so it was all kind of slow rather than, you know, Bam. the business of it. Yeah, that sounds like such a good way to do it. And then I'm sure that probably like carries through with the work that you do now. Like you said, like picking your jobs and then yeah. being fun and being able to find like the enjoyment in it because it's so hard. You're not going to be able to ha sustain that sort of push and drive if you're not getting enjoyment out of your job. Yeah, yeah. I don't really, but you know, and going to drama school is interesting. I know that we'll get onto it, but th this idea of kind of like suffering your art this kind of like byronistic like oh i'm a yeah. suffering artist never bought into that ever because life is really tough and all sorts of things you know personally happen to me at drama school and afterwards and i just thought you know what life will take care of that stuff acting is where i get joy from you know and it doesn't mean that with every job it's got to be this amazing life altering experience it can be pleasant it can be nice it's fine for it to be those things it can be nourishing it doesn't have to be a battle and that's even when i've done stuff that's quite difficult that's quite you know uh you know harrowing i've always managed to find the joy in it so yeah it's it, it, it's definitely <laughs> it's definitely um impacted what i've ended up doing which is largely comedy there you go <laughs> So, so let's talk about then when when you were in NYT. Yeah, I, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. You will. Yeah. Um, that was the point where you got your agent before you yes. then went to drama school. So, yes. so how did you get that first agent? Was did they come to a show and scout you, or how did that happen? Yeah, uh, agent came to scout to to scout to scout. To scout. Uh, they came to scout and they scouted me. Um, I was how old was I at that point? I was maybe seventeen, I think. Wasn't looking for an agent. It happened to a few of us. Um, and the setup of NYT was quite different. Now they have showcases. You've got the NYT rep, so they do shows. They invite agents. That wasn't what it was. Yeah. An agent would either come of their own volition or a casting director would only you know come because they wanted to, or you invited them. Um, but I was doing um, an Easter show, so it wasn't one of the summer shows. The cost um, agent saw me called Jackie Williamson. Shout out Jackie Williamson, my first agent. And <laughs> um, and yeah, and she was just like, "You're great. Uh, do you want to do it?" And I was like, "Sure." And so she taught me everything. Like we would go over auditions together. It was kind of like a coach. It wasn't like a be there in Soho at four forty-five. And um, and I got my first television job, and that was a a TV film called That Summer Day, which was about the London bombings. I was playing one of the children who was sort of experiencing the day, which was kind of surreal because that is what happened to me. I was like on the way to sixth form when that all happened. So, um, and it was great, but <laughs> it was frustrating because there was like a few takes that I'd be like, yeah, that was good. And then there'll be other takes where I was like, that was terrible. And I couldn't tell you why. And that annoys me, not kind of being in control. And when I say control, I don't mean like knowing exactly what I'm going to do, but not knowing, oh, that was wrong because, or not wrong, that's the wrong language, but the wrong language. Uh, that wasn't quite, that didn't feel quite natural because, dot, 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 didn't have the language. 
Yeah. And so I was, after that was I'm going to drama school because I can't, it can't be a shoot in the dark and see what sticks um, for me, especially on set. You want it to be that free, but there's time <laughs> and there's hundreds of other people watching you like, do you want to get it right today? And you're like, oh, do it. And you know, we were kids, so they were very um, patient and everything with us. But I'm like, there's going to be a time when I'm in my thirties and no one's going to be this nice. <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah, so that was the job that made me go, I want to go to drama school. Wow. Okay. So was it, um, do you think that you were actually not, not happy with it in yourself? Or do you think that the take that you were given wasn't good enough? Do you actually um, think it wasn't good enough? Or was it just your... I, I thought it wasn't good enough. I just could hear, I, I, I could just hear the words coming out of my mouth. And I was like, to be very sort of based with it, I was like, I don't believe that. Oh, I don't believe that. When I say that, no, I didn't believe that time. And then there'll be other times like, I believe that. But I couldn't tell you why couldn't it was mainly about truth than yeah. anything just hear it you know when you know you're lying oh, I yeah. could catch myself and I still get it now I'm like oh no particularly with voice work if I do voice work I'll hear myself and go I'll just like take my own take and go back but that's what I was like really could feel it quite viscerally and I thought nah I don't I don't of course you're going to not hit it every time but I want to know what about it I, I, what about it wasn't quite right even if it is just this feeling, I just was getting really frustrated with myself and you don't have the time to do that on set. You don't. So yeah, yeah it was jet. I'd be wrapped and I thought I'm going to ex- try this thing that people keep talking about, which is drama school. That's amazing. So you were really, really clear because I think quite a, quite a lot of people, I mean, an R and they don't really know if it's the right course yeah. for them, if they should, especially because, you know, you were booking jobs before. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I mean, my agent wasn't, Better, Jackie. She wasn't happy. She was just like, "You're fine. You look eight. Keep working." And I'm like, "I'm not gonna look eight forever. Like, I need more." And I do think that um, the climate is different. I think that for someone like me, working class, no real connections to the industry. You know, my sister was doing musical theatre, but that was that's a different ball game. It's a different yeah. discipline. And I. It, I just thought if I'm in this place and you're learning all this stuff and then at the end of it you have a showcase that seems like the smartest way in then of course I looked at the money because that was the thing that would, that decided whether I was going to go or not and then I realized that you get a grant or a loan and that was like going to university so I was like well I'll be in as much debt as all my friends who are going to university so I'm going to do that of course the debt is different now it's like triple now yeah. And there are a lot more courses for acting on screen. Um, there is a lot more courses like the, like the MIT Rep that doesn't take three, four years of your life. So it's a lot different than it was then. But for me, I was just like, if I want to learn, I'll go to the school of all the acting to learn. Surely. It just made sense to me. Um, so I auditioned the first year and I didn't get in. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was 18. And that was and there, there as well. You auditioned. Was it just yeah, as oh, in your mind? Oh my God. My first audition to Rado was awful. <laughs> I was so scared because I've got this. Th- I mean, it's getting better. But if I go into a big building that looks kind of old, I'm immediately intimidated. Yeah. I, I just, and I'm not the only person, but I immediately, I'm like, I don't want to touch anything. I'll break something. I'm not meant to be here. I'm not meant to be here. I'm not meant to be here. And I dried in my audition. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was a, it was a, can I swear? Sure. It was Go a on. shit show. That's the only one that I'll do. That's it. <laughs> That's um, it was horrible. And, th- but the panel were really lovely. They could tell I was nervous beyond, there was, they were just like, oh, okay. You okay? And I was like, I'm fine. I'm like, okay, how old are you? I was like 18. I'm like, mm, maybe come back next year. It was actually what they said. Wow. And so I auditioned for Rada and I auditioned for Guildhall. Same thing. They said, come back in a year. Come back in a year. Um, and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to come back in a year. So I remember I had a few more auditions for places and I cancelled them. Because I thought, 
I think I just need to rest at 18. I need to rest. <laughs> Knackered. <Neither. laughs> Knackered. You're 18. Just <laughs> oh, God. Um, so I rested and I had fun. And, you know, people go on like gap year. I didn't have, I mean, I just, I worked in Magnitude Swords. Um, I bought plays. I went to go and see plays. Um, I just sort of got a grasp of what I liked and what I didn't. I didn't know what my taste was. I didn't know what I liked. And so I spent a year um, chilling out, having fun, and deciding what I liked and spending time in the National Theatre Bookshop and getting a lot of help from people. And then I found the right speeches. And the next year I went in and I got into Raja so fast. <laughs> like It was like a four week period where I just went, audition one two three four in I was like oh wow that was nice <laughs> so how did you decide then what was the right monologues for you what was the difference between the years yeah so the first year I was picking speeches what would be an impactful speech what would be an interesting speech the next year I picked parts that I wanted to play yeah the whole way through so I think I picked and they have this rule about, you know, pick someone around your age and whatever. And I was like, like, there's not that many, like, parts for me, my age, that I wouldn't know. Especially when you're young, you're a young woman, young girl. A lot of the parts are a bit... I was... And my taste, actually, is I love old parts. I was obsessed with Helen Mirren. By this point, I was obsessed with Helen Mirren because I genuinely thought... She's like, what, in her 60s? And she looks like she's having the most fun. She looks like yeah. insecure. Like, does everyone like me, like, idiot that I was? And so I think I ended up picking Cleopatra. Did I pick Cleopatra? I think I did. I was like, this. Nice. This woman. Um, and then <laughs> I can't even remember the, the modern piece that I picked. But I remember even when I was nervous around it in the interview and stuff like that, when I did the speeches, I was like, yeah. I'd like to do all of this. Yeah. And I, that was the biggest difference. Right, that's amazing. I've have, I have a few questions from a yeah. uh, lady called Louisa Fischelt. I do apologize yeah. if I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> um, but she, she's, I, I, I gather from her questions that she's looking at applying to drama schools now. Um, we've spoken about your experiences auditioning, but what was it about Rada? Like, how did you make that decision that that was the right one for you? Um, quite simple really um i heard that it was the greatest drama school and i got in it's as simple as that i think that uh it's different now but i think that for a lot of people you can apply for all of them i'm going to be very frank with you you can apply for all of them but if you get into rada you're going to go to rada like you just are yeah you are so that was it it was it was the place and I, I didn't know I was like I wasn't like mm, no no just gone right no I went to see I did go and see a third year show and I was like like that cool brilliant lovely it wasn't very investigative it just was like it's Rada and also I was thinking at that point you know I want to go to a drama school where you know if we do a showcase people are going to come yeah and, and they will definitely go to the Rada I mean you're, you're totally yeah. right there's there's no real if you had said another school maybe we'd have a few reasons around that but rada is rada it's like it's rada it sounds wanky, it's rada. It is. Rada. right you're wrong you know i'm not going to the same rada as you know adrian lester or kenneth branner i'm not going to the same place the institution changes that's why it is good to go and do your research to go and see the third year shows um, to go and see see the kind of actors that they're accepting what is it about them because there is kind of you know there is a vibe, but like our year group had a big, big old vibe, our year group. We were quite a sexy group. Um, and you can feel it, and then the year above, they've got their vibe. The year below, they've got their vibe. Like, do all that, because then you might go, hmm, the vibe at Rod is a bit weird, but over here, over here at Guildhall, like, it's all popping off. So, but I didn't do that. I just was like, that one. Also, I didn't really have the internet then. We couldn't really afford a computer, so it wasn't, I just was like, uh, I got into more of the royal in the name. Yeah, amazing. So went, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love it. So, um, training at RADA then, yeah. um, you mentioned earlier that you um, were, were like 
drawn to comedy roles or you at least you'd like to watch them with the training at RADA did it did were you doing a lot of comedy there like did you sort of cement yourself as a comedy performer there or was it afterwards no I didn't no comedy not really we did I think we did a comedy term of did a comedy um but no no it wasn't oh Susan's funny she's gonna play all the funny parts not at all not at all um I was funny amongst my peers. I think that that was known, that I could be quite quick and all of that. But did that translate? I think I think what happens at, what happened at RADA then, because um, I don't know what it's like now, is they look at what your strengths are and they try their very hardest to not make you do that. So you can, you feel like a really bad actor for quite a while <laughs> um, because the last time that you're good was your audition that got you in. And then they're like, okay, you do that thing. That's your little trick thing. That's your little thing that you, you do when you're nervous on stage or da da da. And it's this weird process of like learning what all your tricks are, all your natural habits, trying to get rid of them. And then when you go out into the world, your sort of natural habits are normally the things that get you employed. So, <laughs> so it's quite, it's a bit weird. But I think ultimately what it does is it gives you a toolkit you can go right I know that I have good comic timing but also I know that I smashed the hell out of playing Juliet that one time in the second year so I know that that's within me mm -hmm. even though the world might not see it yet but I did that and that's something that I'm really proud of that teachers still talk about 12 people saw it but I know that I did it and it's there so it, it allows you to play those parts and also allows you to do parts that you go oh no not for me <laughs> so so when you come out of drama school did you change yeah. agent then because you're with are you with 42 now oh i'm with 42 on my literary agent um kathy ah. and kate my literary agent because i write now um but i'm with scott marshall partners and i've been with them since i left drama oh, school. okay so, so they came to the to the showcase at the end and then that's yeah you. yeah so that was so the way that scott marshall worked which I think um, sort of comes from my National Youth Theatre days, is they um, have one list of actors. And uh, so I've got a theatre agent, a TV agent, film agent, but they look after one list, as opposed to at other agencies where one agent has a full list, another agent has a full list. So they're kind of in competition with each other, whereas they all look after you. So it feels like you've got like a mafia of agents. And it really does. And, um, and I loved that. I absolutely loved that. I loved that there was loads of hands on deck. Because for me, as a black woman, you need loads of hands on deck. And I loved that. And I loved that they would have discussions together about, okay, we have this action. What do you think of this? Da, da, da. And you were never in competition with anyone else on your list. If they both think that you're great for a part, they'll both send you up. Like, that was just the way it was. But the downside of that, it meant that... I think all the main agents at Scott Marshall had to see your third year performances. Right. And just because of scheduling, sometimes an agent might see you and then the other agents can't make it. So they all have to agree before they take you on. And they came to me quite late. They came to me sort of, I think, three shows in because I was with in a show with somebody else at Caldervano Jeremiah, big up Ivano, um, who they were gonna sign and they saw me and they were like, oh she's cool, but it was like total fluke. Like <laughs> they saw me in the show. So I was lucky that I had enough shows and then the showcase. But they signed me right at the end. Everyone else was like starting to audition for Transformers 2 and whatever. And like at the end they were like, you I was like, wow, took your time, didn't you? Yes. But they were thorough. I can't even imagine, like, I've gone to quite a lot of uh, showcases and just the, the after the showcase when you're all sort of waiting outside in the foyer, it's just the most, like, nerve-wracking thing because, oh, I don't know, just my heart just sinks every oh, time. I just went for the table and I just started eating the chicken. I was That's like, what I do. I just was like, listen, <laughs> you lot decide. Don't you don't speak to me, it's fine. And I was so hungry, I just went to go and eat. <laughs> so I did. Didn't speak I to would, anyone, no networking. I would have come to find you because I'm the same. <laughs> um, 
somebody, somebody just asked, um, she's 42. Wow. No, she's not 42. <laughs> 42 is the name of an agency. Um, yes, they're an acting agency and they also are a literary agency and they look after directors and they're great. So um so you mentioned we mentioned earlier, or you mentioned earlier rather, um that you uh see you know, you, you take on the jobs that you want to do because of the people and because of you know whatever. But you have obviously, I think, must have a very good gut instinct for jobs that you accept because everything that you've worked on has been amazing so oh, thank you. That, so when you get sent an offer for a role or if you get sent a script to read for or whatever is that decision decision come from you or are you being guided by your agent at scott marshall like how do you decide interesting well i i had a chat with scott marshall right at the beginning and I can't believe I said this, but I was very honest. I was I was very scared about going out into the world um, financially because my family didn't have money. They didn't support me during drama school at all. And the idea of living independently without this grant loan um, <laughs> was really scary. So I remember I said, look, there's, and also I'd heard from, my friends who were with like huge agencies I'd sort of heard the kind of like no we don't want you to audition for this this is too small this is and I just said to them look I I don't have money and so anything that comes in be it a reading be it you know whatever please let, like field it to me yeah. and then we'll decide and so that was back in 2010 and it's 2020 and we still do that they will call me and they'll be like this thing's come in da, 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 da. we don't think you should do it but it's there and sometimes i've gone yeah i need that 50 quid it could be really handy i've got to pay for this yeah and they'll go okay <laughs> like, so we have this there's no kind of because i've got i've had friends and especially now that i'm writing and i've got friends who are writers where they'll want to get a script to an actor and they'll send it off and their agent hasn't passed it on to that actor yeah. and they bump into that actor and the actor's like i'd love to read it you don't know what's going on even those big old stars you don't know and so i think you know from a, a surviving point of view for any agent to do that I, I you know okay maybe there are some actors who really can't deal with the amount of scripts that they get but i just i i can't i would be so mad if my agent was stopping me potentially doing work it's a really hard business look at pandemic like yeah you know there's, there's a few things that i would have been like probably before would have been like oh i'm too busy but now i'll be like oh got them yeah it's been yeah. months <laughs> so, do you know what i mean so we have this really open relationship where it's everything is filled to me it doesn't matter what it is and then we make a decision sometimes they know what the answer is going to be but i just appreciate them coming to me particularly the first five years out of drama school man there were some things that came in that saved me got that rent in time so um so yeah it's really collaborative that way it changed a bit when i had american rep where it was a bit like we want to save you for this or you've just done this big show on netflix so we just want you to be available this magic thing being available which is um doesn't pay rent. You can't tell your landlord, I'm just available. <laughs> um, but I'm good, but I am good at going, I can't be available, I need some money. Um, so yes, that when there's sort of more people yeah. involved, it gets a bit harder to manage. Um, but I've, I've always sort of prouded myself of being very transparent and really honest. And sometimes I will just do a job that I know that they're all going, no, and I'm like, it looks fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so who are you with in in America in the US then? Well, I was with uh, with Gersh uh, and Three Sixty, but now I'm not. Oh. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, can't go into it too much, but it isn't anything sinister. Um, I <laughs> am. It isn't at all. Um, I have so many writing projects. <laughs> that I'm not really available. Yeah. And so that just goes, to, that gets to a point where it's like, what 
is it actually good business to have these people in the States who I actually, I can't take for anything because I've got this film that we want to shoot next year that I'm going to direct and there's going to be the pre-production and there's going to be the post-production. And so it just became, yeah. I mean, I wasn't going to be working, doing any stateside work until the next like four years. So four years, who knows? could be tomorrow. Um, but it was just looking like, actually, I don't want to waste your time, you don't want to waste my time. So we yeah. hearted like amicably and hopefully on the other side of it, we'll have a chat. Um, but yeah, that's the way. Really amazing uh, manager called Kelly Alec in, at 360, who's great and she loves British work. She looks after British actors. Shout out to Kelly. Um, so yes, we're still like in conversation. So is it anything? <laughs> that leads me on really, really nicely to um, your writing work. And I was going to ask you, so I didn't, did you just say that you're directing something? Fingers crossed in conversation. Oh, yes. no. Okay, so I actually re-listened, because I listened to the Guilty Feminist podcast, like, yeah. really anyway. Um, but <laughs> I re-listened to your Women in Charge on film, I think it was, episode yeah. And you were saying yeah. on that episode that you were doing a directing course with Rain Dance, which obviously paid yeah. off. Did you do it in the end? No, I didn't do it. Um, what happened was I was busy with work. I paid for it. Ah. And if anyone wants it, actually, if anyone wants the course, I'll give it to you. Um, first dibs. Um, I didn't, I didn't get to do it. But I did. So on that episode of Guilty Feminist, we, our guest was a um, director called Jennifer Sheridan. And she was just about to direct, what was it, had we done it by then? I think we'd done it by then. Um, my short film that I'd written called Love the Sinner, um, which did really well, got into London Film Festival, shortlisted, longlisted for a bitha. Um, so it was great, like really, really good fun. And uh, when I was at London Film Festival, this was last year, so enjoying going to all the talks and stuff, I kept meeting other female filmmakers. Um, uh, brilliant women sort of going, are you going to direct? Because it had been announced in my feature films called Three Weeks, which I've done BBC Films. Are you going to direct it? And I was like, nah, no, mm -mm, no, no, no. And, um, and then they kept saying, why not? Why not? Why not? And then uh, our DOP, um, Ryan Edelston, he had worked with Alice Lowe on Prevenge, which yeah. she wrote, directed, starred in. He'd worked with and Jessica Hines on the fight, which she wrote, directed, starred in. So we just had a conversation where he talked to me about that process. And obviously, they're very two, um, they're two very different performers and writers. But he talked about, you know, literally helping uh, a performer writer do this thing. And so it just demystified it for me. So we're in talks to, you know, see whether that can that can happen. And it would be with Ryan choosing it. So um, yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> So, so did you always write then when you were in drama school or before, or is it something that's come along later on for you? Um, yeah, no, I didn't write at all until uh, I think 2016 is when I had my first kind of offer um, to, well, first commission basically. And I definitely think it was off the back of chewing gum because that had just been out and done really super well and um and yeah I just had a, a producer get in touch and said we really love your work do you write and I was very very honest I said no I don't and he was like oh we would like to develop something with you and um I remember speaking to my friend Abby Ajaye who's a really accomplished writer and I felt guilty I was like you know you're right, you've been writing for so many years, I'm just some upstart actress and I feel bad that I've got this commission basically without working as hard as you have. And she gave me the best bit of advice. She went, follow the green lights. If someone's saying go, go. Also, if you were a man, they wouldn't think twice. They'll be like, yes, I've done really good work acting and now people think that it's gonna transfer into a script. It might. And she was like, you've been on set since you were 17. You've been acting since you were a teenager. Like, you know scripts. You know what makes a good script. And so, yeah, so that was my first commission. And that was really, really interesting learning 
what I wanted to write, what other people wanted me to write, going, hmm, it's not what I want to write, then moving on. <laughs> but it was great. It was a really, really great process. But there was definitely, I think the double-edged sword of that was, chewing gum was a hit. We want you to write something yesterday. And I was like, what's the rush? So I've never been one to, I'm in no race with anyone but myself, genuinely. Big up Helen Mirren for making me realize that. I just thought, what's the rush? And there was a bit sort of like, you've got to capitalize on this thing. And I didn't want to do that. And so I really took my time sort of discovering what I wanted to write. And then that's how the short came about. And then that's how the features come about. And But you know, that first commission, that script got me my agents at 42. It got me other commissions, but that wasn't the thing. But the first thing to be the thing is rare. And actually, I don't trust things like that. Oh, it's just arrived in 20 seconds. Don't trust it. So yeah, it's been great. That's really great. I mean, you took your time there with, um, you know, to your point, deciding to go to drama school. Like everybody yeah. said, oh, this is your time. You've got to capitalize on this. And then, and, then, and that is like, the, well, it's not the easy option, but it is the default option to, right, let's just run with this now and just get it done. Yeah. Because it's all going to go away very quickly. I need to take yeah. it now, but that's yeah. amazing that you've been able to, from a young age, just really harness that and like take your time and decide what it actually is to you. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I just think that particularly for women, I think there's such and you know, I remember being a, a teenager and Britney Spears was huge and my God, every sentence was, she's 16. She's just 16. She's just 16. And then Christina Aguilera came out and Mandy Moore. And there was just such emphasis in them being bloody 16 all the time. I just remember thinking, I don't want that. Like I'm spotty and sweaty. One boob's bigger than the other. Hair sprouting everywhere. I don't want to be on the center stage of anywhere at the moment whilst I'm trying to figure myself out. And also I really, really believe in learning from your mistakes. That's one of the reasons why I went to drama school because it's a cocoon and you can learn from your mistakes without a camera on you. And I think when you, there is so much value on youth being young, particularly for women. I'm like, so where's the space for you to make mistakes, get it wrong? And I just, it, that makes me very, very nervous. So I'm fine with things not being flashy and on it and on a roll and loud, not because I'm this humble, whatever, but I, I, there's so much value in, in your mistakes. And you make loads of mistakes and you learn from them the older you get, I think, if you're receptive, if you are a receptive person. And so I, with the writing thing very quickly, I was like, I don't, I don't want to rush. I really want to figure out what I want to write and what I want to say, because if it isn't like with acting, actually, if it isn't good enough, if I'm not any good, I don't want to do it. Like, yeah, it's fine. So uh, we were going to speak about confidence and I think that yeah. sort of, does that sort of answer it for you or is that like a bit of an antidote for self, like um, feeling self-conscious is taking your time and working out what it is. Um, the question, sorry, the question is, let me be a bit more clear. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, obviously you, your, your performance, work, your work in acting is incredible and, and you've worked on some amazing projects now, now you do with the guilt, guilty feminist stand up comedy, which is yeah. <laughs> hilarious, and amazing. So, like the level of confidence, I have a really good friend who is um, a stand up comedian, and I'm, I'm always like, "What? Like, how are you doing that?" So, so is that where your confidence comes from? Like taking your time, or is there? Is it just you know what is it? Um. Well, for a long time, I. Confidence came from other people, which is a very dicey space. I would have people say, you're good, you're really good at this, you should do this. I'd be like, yeah, gosh, it feels good when you say that I'm good at this, I should do it. And then the thing that drama school does is they take those voices away. And even, you know, even if your peers might think that you're good, they can sometimes feel threatened by you, so they don't tell you. They can be so consumed in their kind of stuff, so they don't tell you that you're good. You've got your teachers who are trying to get you away from the things that you think you're good at. So you just feel, um, you, you don't feel great. But drama school was where I learned 
what am I what am I doing this for? Who am I doing this for? And I really sort of got away from, you know, I want to show this person or I want to do that. I just, it really became, I sort of did a 360 and it was about me enjoying it. Yeah. If I don't enjoy it, what's the point? So I get my confidence from enjoyment. When I'm having, this sounds so vague, but when I'm having fun is when I feel confident. And I think that's why it goes, why my career is sort of lent into, dra- into comedy because I have fun in the process. I find it a very fun process. I love making people laugh. It, it relaxes you. I think Phoebe Waller-Bridge said that there's something about if you make someone laugh, they're open, and then that's when you can make them cry. And that's how you get to them, laughter. And I think that that is where I get my confidence from, is when I feel joy. Um, yeah, and that's really got me through some sticky dark patches of this career is when I'm like oh I remember that I love that or I remember that I enjoy that um but it's hard it's a it's a flimsy source of <laughs> confidence but it's all you got because it's kind of you know acting particularly it's dreams it's made out of dreams and hope and luck to think that there is a formula be it go to drama school be it do this or do that is just Every time you think it's that, the goalposts change (laughs) and then it's something else. And so one of the things that I have really, you know, lent into is the kind of insecurity of it. If you're not friends with that, it's going to be heartbreaking for you. I remember sort of saying to my mum when she asked me, you know, what's your plan? And I was like, hope, hope and stardust. Like that is what this game is and if it is something you know it it's different for everybody but this is how I survive on it if I look on it if I look at the industry and I go it is just dust and magic then it makes me go okay cool but if I go all right I've got to do do this and do that and meet that person do this it just it's too much pressure on yourself and it doesn't work for me it's about understanding that it could be anyone's what success looks like is different and it changes and that's where I get my confidence from is who knows it could go so badly wrong but it could also be bloody brilliant and you just have to be in it you've just got to see it's not helpful but I think particularly in 2020 you try and make a plan forget it like there's no point yeah 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 exactly exactly um so I'm going to go to some um, questions from uh, people who are watching. And we've had questions before because we've had loads and I I don't want to miss anybody off. So, um, so, uh, okay, we've already approached that. Nice broad win. So, um, Temi Babola has asked, um, what advice would you give to your younger self or people who want to make it as an actress or actor when they're younger? Oh, okay. Let me really think about this one. Um, oh, God, I really felt that right there. Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, I would say, oh, just thinking of a sweaty, <laughs> lopsided oh, Little Susie. <laughs> little hairy Susie. Um, <laughs> I would say, um, I would say, uh, be kind to yourself. Be really kind to yourself. I'm my strongest critic. There's kind of nothing anyone can say that is worse than what I can say to myself, which can be handy, but it can be really horrible. (laughs) And I think that you have to be your biggest cheerleader. You have to forgive yourself. You have to have compassion for yourself. If you don't have compassion for yourself, you cannot have it for other people. It doesn't work like that. And I did not have a lot of compassion for myself. I think that when you do, you approach work, I think, uh, kinder and more curious. You're less focused on you, you, you. That was one of the things I found quite hard about drama school is that I found it a bit navel gazy, like me, me, my voice, me, me, me. Whereas I've outwards and even though there is um 
importance looking in. I just, I wasn't looking in in the right way. It was critical. Whereas I think there has to be a lot of love for yourself. Half the problems in the world at the moment is because people don't love themselves or care for themselves or think of themselves gently. It's very important, especially in the industry where it's so tough and it's so rough and people do look at you and make a judgment and it can really throw you. Just being able to have compassion for yourself. I would say the sooner you start working on that, the better <laughs> start now. <laughs> yeah, and we've had a couple of comments or questions yeah. rather in the chat box that have, have said, what about advice for older, older actors? But I mean, I, that totally yeah. translates. You need to do the same. <laughs> compassion, compassion and understanding that your age brings knowledge and it, it value. You don't, you're, you're your value doesn't decrease as you get older, it increases and how amazing, what a gift to get older. Um, I, I think that we need to absolutely switch that around. You have knowledge and also maintain your curiosity. Um, I definitely feel like I've hardened over the years, but and that's why I always lean to comedy because it's playful because you can't take yourself too seriously. When you meet comedy people who take themselves too seriously, they're not very nice. So I would say for older people, self-compassion as well, um, collaborate and stay curious, stay playful, stay playful because I mean, it, weirdly, it's all about play, but this industry can kick it out of you. So stay playful and curious. I, oh, I honestly, I'm like really weary of the time because I did say- Oh gosh, I didn't even- <laughs> No, I know as in, as in, and what I'm saying is like, I, I've got all the time in the world, let me tell you, but yeah. I'm sure <laughs> So I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions and then we're yeah. gonna off. But um, honestly, everything you're saying is so helpful to me. <laughs> so <laughs> it's gonna be helpful to everyone else, I'm sure, who are actually actors. Um, yeah. So um, somebody has asked, um, are you more comfortable writing alone on a project or do you prefer working in a group with other writers on a series or something? Oh, great question. So I, uh, I, I've had experience with both. I did, um, I co-wrote an episode of a Sky show called The Reluctant Landlord with Ramesh Ranganathan here in the UK. And I was partnered um, with a very experienced writer called Sean Pye. He's done loads he is like the dude of writing and that was we found a really really good working dynamic but we were very much working to a deadline it was very much kind of like notes from the channel gotta do this notes from the channel gotta do that and i did it and it was great and i learned loads from him but after that experience i went i don't want to be that kind of writer because i have an acting career i guess but i don't want to i don't need I mean, I'm very, very lucky. I don't need to be an actor, a writer for hire because I have my um, writing, my acting career. My acting career definitely influences my writing career because a lot of people write, uh, work with me as a writer performer. Um, so I actually love the solitude of writing. I know a lot of writers are like, I hate it. I love it. I love it. I love just like, I absolutely love it. I love going deep into the rabbit hole. No one can contact me. I absolutely love it. And I think it's because acting can be so sociable, whether you like it or not, you're surrounded by people, all of that. To be able to go, okay, I'm gonna go away and do this. Yeah. I really love it. I think I love it so much right on my own because I have the balance of acting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So has COVID been good for you? Like, have you been writing anything? That's very isolated. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, after a while I was like, this is bollocks, I hate this. Um, but no, I have, yeah, I remember my, so my um, literary agents, Kathy and Kate, right at the top of um, uh, lockdown, they said, you know, this is a really good time for development if your brain can do it. Um, so you have your film three weeks, which I've been writing, I've done like two drafts over COVID. Um, and they're like, if there's any ideas, just like a, an idea that you've always wanted to develop, like we can maybe put something together and send it out. And so I was like, hmm, yes, I've got like a supernatural series idea. And I put together a, a treatment, which is basically, I just write out 
what happens in the pilot, the first episode, and then a brief description of what happens in each episode. And then, so I was writing that and I was getting very, um, I was getting quite frustrated. I was alone, it was getting a bit too much, just writing, writing, writing. And so I decided to make uh, a mood reel. Um, mood reels are normally something that directors make. Yeah. Um, so a selection of scenes with some music to give you the vibe of something. And I think it was also my directing head sort of going, let me try this. And it's so easy to do, like to record from YouTube, put it together on iMovie. That's what I did. So I sent it to um, Kathy and Kate, my literary agents, and they were like, this is brilliant. So we've got the document and we've got the mood reel. Sent it out. And I spent like four weeks, literally four weeks on Zoom meetings with all these production companies. And now we're developing it with something very exciting but that was a, a really good example of kind of doing this thing it isn't working the writing isn't working i'm going to do that no one's told me to do a move room no one suggested it i just went i'm going to do it because i think it'd be more fun yeah. and it just said what i wanted to say about the series so much faster and it worked and so yeah that's something that we're doing at the moment it's been really great but you know the, the moments during lockdown that's been really difficult and you know with black lives matter and um, you know, worrying about friends, family, are they safe, are they okay? The industry, the theatre, and just oh, like live um, performance, comedy, music, musical theatre, like just looking at that. Sometimes you are paralysed with the fear. And so there have been days when I've gone, do you know what that deadline was due today? I can't do it. I just feel really sad. Yeah. And you know what? Everybody has been like, I get it. That's fine. Yeah. Come back when you're ready. That's what's been great is normally, you know, you want to take some time. I'm good at taking time off if, the, if things are getting a bit much. But to be able to go, do you know what? I, I just, it's it's horrible at the moment. It's really, really scary. Um, and I just need a minute. And for, you know, all these producers at all these different production companies to go, yeah, no, we get it. Take, take your time. I think was really lovely because I also believe one thing if I was to give advice to my younger self and to older people, vulnerability is a superpower. Mm. I think that was so much onus is put on strength, resilience, you know, withstanding, you know, difficult stuff. Vulnerability is the thing. Being able to go, this is what I need right now, or I can't do this right now, yeah. or I just want to do this because this is fun, or, hey, agent, I've not got any money. Can we, um, can I can I do this or yeah I do actually want to direct my film even though I've never directed a film before because every director's never directed a film before at some point um and just saying it and just going this is what how can we make it happen I don't know tell me let me learn I think it's really really important and so um I have a lot more respect for my vulnerability because if we've all gone through this and people are like you've got to smash this deadline and you've got to work until you're bloody on your last legs I'm like well then you're an idiot yeah. because we have to look after ourselves mm -hmm. um yeah i think vulnerability as well like as soon as somebody is vulnerable in a situation which feels like everyone needs to be a certain thing it yeah. breaks down straight away and then as soon as that happens it's like the creativity is all at once open out of the box and you're able to just communicate yeah. and not like feel i've been in loads of situations where i've been like I've got an idea, but I don't want to say what it is because I'm. If it, if it's wrong, then I'm I'm younger than you and I'm different from you or whatever it is. Yeah. So vulnerability is definitely something, and like the compassion from uh, vulnerability over this time. Now, if that continues past COVID, then at least we've got that out of this whole situation. We need it in this industry because sometimes it can be a bit like push, push, push until you're dead, and you're just thinking why. Like, actually, an example of vulnerability. Last year, I uh, auditioned for Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, they were doing it at Regent's Park Theatre. I really wanted to do some theatre. Regent's Park is so beautiful. I just was going through a breakup, and I said to my agent, I think that this would be fun. And it was to play bottom. I was like, I think that could be funny. My agent was like, wow. I don't know about that, mate. And I remember I <laughs> met um, Dominic Hill, the director, um, and I sat, so I, I sent in a tape actually initially because I wasn't available. And then I got a recall during all this horrible stuff that was going on. And I didn't, I, I didn't think I could be funny enough. Um, I didn't know why he'd called me in. 
and I remember Vicky Richardson, the casting director, who's absolutely lovely, I told her, I was like, I'm going through this breakup, it's really, really difficult, and I'm feeling this way, and she was like, don't, don't worry, we got you, we got you. Um, and so I went in, and I, I just had to, this meeting with Dominic, where I just went, I don't, I don't know why you think I can do this, and so I just need to know, what did you see that makes you think I could do this? And he said, well, I know somebody who was in your year at drama school, and they told me that you played one of the best Juliets that they've ever seen. And I was like, who the hell said, you wouldn't tell me. <laughs> it was like, I'm not gonna tell you. So I know you can do Shakespeare, because it was about Shakespeare, specifically. Yeah. I just didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I had, I just didn't think I could do it, it'd been so long. And he was like, no, I've been, I've, no, I've been told on the sly that you did some Shakespeare once and it was very, very good. Um, <laughs> and I told him, I was like, you know, I don't think I can be funny. And he was like, don't worry, I got you. And I ended up having the best summer, one of the best summers of my career. So much fun. And it was because I turned up, and I'm not saying that you've got to always turn up to auditions with your problems. I had a relationship with Vicky Richardson. <laughs> and so she knew me and I could do that. Um, and they knew that I was from an NR and about doing it. So Dominic, our director, knew that he had to get me on board. Um, but just to turn up and go, look, I, you know, whether it's at the audition, whether it's in the rehearsal room, just go and look, I, I don't know, is fine. And we should all lean into that. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. And you had incredible reviews from that too. Yeah, it went all right. <laughs> damn good so um you know it's all worth it in the end i think you've given such amazing advice and we we really have run really over but um oh I, yeah sorry guys no i mean nobody's sorry. left so we're all <laughs> this has been incredible oh. such good advice two things that you've got coming up which um yes. i just mentioned to you before we came on i've had a lush morning watching enola holmes <laughs> Never know where. Um, so um, you're in Enola Holmes and you play Edith, and that yes, is on Netflix when? Oh, next Wednesday, September 23rd. Lovely, and yeah. it is like the best cast possible. You've got Millie, <laughs> Millie Bobby Brown, and you've got Henry Cavill, and you've got Helen, Hannah Bon Helena Bonacarta, and yeah. also you um so tell tell us a bit about the film and your role in it because you've got such a wicked role in it. such a cool role. which is actually loosely based on a real woman i am gonna get her name wrong she was also called edith and she taught the suffragettes jiu-jitsu with her husband she's a real woman way and actually helena bonham carter's character in the film suffragette sarah gavron film was also called edith also loosely based on this Edith. So, um, so yeah, there were like lots of stuff to read up about her. Obviously it wasn't the same, it's not the same character, but I had to learn a bit of Jiu Jitsu, had to throw Millie Bobby Brown around. She was 15 at the time, that felt weird. Cause like, that's a child and they're like, ah! <laughs> that was strange. But she was great. Um, and yeah, it was my, it was, you know, it's a big old Hollywood film. That was like the first thing but big Hollywood film that I've been part of. Uh, it was one of, it was my first film offer. Um, didn't audition for it, literally just turned up and I was like, that's cool. Um, and, and so yeah, it was really, really, really great. I'm very grateful for it. It came at a very good time in my life. And it was, it's always good when those big people are really lovely. Like Helena is brilliant in particular. We hung out a lot. Um, on set, well, not like BFFs. Yeah. That sounded like, <laughs> you know, I'm not. Um, but it was really, really, really fun. Really fun. And the and costumes were nuts. Oh my and God. Got oh, yeah. different. <laughs> so, so um, that's something that, oh gosh, there's so many things I want to ask you. But um, so, your, um, how, with, with auditioning now, obviously, you just yeah. mentioned here that um, I think this is something that I definitely didn't know when I came into casting was. Yeah. That Actors just get offered roles when they get to a certain level. They don't have to audition for the roles. So you're there now. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> no, I've had stuff like this. Oh my God, Susan, we love you. Oh my God, we've watched you over the rabbit. We think that you're amazing. I literally had this, this was just in November. 
And this cast of no, not cast directors, this director was like, oh my God, we just think you're amazing. I did the audition. She was like, well, it's yours, isn't it? It's what she said. Was that cast? No. <laughs> Went to someone else. Don't tell an actor that they've got it in the room. If it, that's happened to me a couple of times. What? Yeah. They just get a bit excited because you're there. Because I've seen you in a few things. And then somebody else comes in and really smashes it. It's just like, calm down. Just because I've been in a couple of things doesn't mean that I'm necessary. You might meet this other actor who's barely done anything. You might just come and hit me to the post. As it should be. Yeah. But yeah, so it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't always work in your way. Which is good. It brings you back down to earth. I thought I had that in the bag. Wow. <laughs> God, that's really bad to do that though, to, to anybody. I know, it was bad practice. But it's, um, you know, I do get offered a lot more things. Uh, and that is really, really cool. It's really, really lovely. And um, it, obviously it's happening now at a time when I'm like writing. So I now need to prioritise, oh, do I want to go and do this? Or do I want to create the thing? Um, but, you know, with Anola Holmes, it was a no, it was a no brainer. I didn't even know what I was like. That sounds fun. Who, what, who's in it? Yeah. Okay. And then I like, forgot about it. <laughs> I forgot about it. And I was like, oh, sure, I've got to do that thing. And it was oh, that's a laugh. But no, even even those actors that you think they don't audition audition for stuff, if it's a big old Marvel film, they're gonna get you in 20 times. Yeah. There's always a point where you're like, oh I've made it, I've made it, and the song goes, mm, always. So not necessarily. So that is a, an amazing film, though, and I, I, I urge you all to watch it. That's next Wednesday. It's coming out on Netflix. And there's loads of great stuff on Netflix at the moment. And yeah. um, also, Truth Seekers, you play Helen in. That's on, is that on Amazon Prime? Yes. And it's Simon Pegg. That's on Amazon Prime, yeah. That's going to be out in the autumn. Yeah, and it's, um, it's with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Yeah, yeah, Simon Pegg. Nick Frost, yeah, it's a cool old gang. I mean, that was, um, you know, it's definitely a supporting role, but I've been a huge fan of Nick Frost and Simon Pegg since Spaced on Channel 4. And, um, yeah, I, it was one of those things. I was like, I want to be with them. I want to be in the room. I want to learn. And I did. I learned loads. Um, and it was really fun. <laughs> I absolutely love the work that they do together so I'm so excited to watch more of it I've watched a couple of episodes and it's amazing but yeah I want to watch more oh cool <laughs> so um I, I'm, you're getting so much love in the chat box and um so much love from oh. me I've honestly had such a lush, lush time talking to you so thank you so much oh, and yeah, um, no everyone watch everything that you've got coming up and also you know when you've got your film stuff coming out we should chat to you again yes. because that's a different hat and I think you'll have loads of advice around that that will be helpful for people. So yeah, when you're doing all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's all about demystifying it. So I'd love to talk about the process and how it all happened or not. <laughs> it, will, yeah. it will, it will, it will. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and thank you everyone for watching. Oh, sorry. If you want to follow us on Instagram, Ooh. I've got to do all the social, sorry, I forget. Um, backstage cast on do Instagram. It. <laughs> backstage on Twitter, at Backstage on Twitter. I'm at Hannah Casting on Twitter. And Susan, what's your Twitter and Instagram if you want people to have a look at you? <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not on Twitter anymore because I, I just couldn't do it for my mental health. I was like, I'm out. But yeah. I am on Instagram. I've got a stupid handle on Instagram. Oh, Susie Woozy. Yeah, it's Susie Woozy 12. I've been told to change it. No. I don't, I don't want to change it. It's there. I, I mostly post about work. It can be a bit cringe, but I, I don't know what else to use it for. I, ha I say some jokes too. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Have a look at that then, Susie Woozy Twelve. A good name. I'm gonna call myself. I'm gonna say it. Wow. I'll change mine to Howa Wawa Twelve. Do that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.